What are you up to, huh? All right, what are we gonna do, chase rabbits? No, we better talk to the people. Hey, hi everybody. It's Robert Earl out here at the Eco Ranch in Far West Texas with Cascade the Wonder Dog, of course. Today we're gonna talk about part one. I guess it's actually part two, but let's call it part one. Part one of the turret build, which is the footing. Preparing, we're, uh, preparing the footing and pouring the footing. So what, we're, what I'm gonna do is we're gonna discuss it a little, talk about soil types and how you can check into soil types. Uh, I'm gonna show you how I, uh, how I did the, um, um, the forms for this circular turret and uh, gonna pour it and then we're done. So I think we better get going, don't you? me cutting up rebar. These are the rebars that are going to form, help form the circle as I do my forms here in the, um, uh, for the footing of the, um, of the turret build. But to start this thing off, why don't we talk about soil and soil types. So again, I'm going to refer you to your, um, to your butt cracks and your building codes because Depending on where you live, those building codes, you know, they get excessive. And I've had people say, well, the liberals made them excessive. Maybe, but then you can look at the other side and say, well, the conservatives made it excessive because they're protecting the HVAC industry or the lumber industry or whatever industry that's helping by donating money to their campaigns and giving them money. So it doesn't matter whether it comes from the liberals being overprotective or from uh, the conservatives protecting the businesses that donate to them. The fact of the matter is a lot of times you come up to like that thing that happened about 30 years ago where that 83-year-old woman ordered coffee from McDonald's, spilled it in her lap, burned herself, and sued McDonald's. Now that's stupid, and some of our building codes are stupid. But when I say let's check with the building, uh, with the building codes and the butt cracks, um, I mean that you want to find out about the soil type in your particular area. We're pretty, um, we've got a pretty simple thing here with our soil, and I'll tell you that in a minute. But where you live, and I mentioned in the preview about uh, New Orleans or Houston with gumbo soil, and I left out the whole frost belt up there. You know, if you go to sub-freezing for uh, periods of time, you have a frost line, and that frost line heaves as it freezes and thaws. You also have water tables. That water table rises up like what I had living on the Suwannee River in Florida. That water table comes up, it also causes heave. And I learned, I learned that the hard way, and that's a story I won't tell you today, but I did learn that the hard way with our cottage in, in uh, North Florida. The thing is, the codes that they have are designed to give you, and the codes really do pretty much, they seem excessive a lot of times, and they are but they oftentimes are a minimum acceptable. So like, let's say that you live in um, um, Massachusetts. I don't know, maybe there's a county in Massachusetts. I just don't know. But let's say you live there, you do have a frost line to worry about. The code may say to go to four feet. And I know this because I just saw it on this old house. The code may say to go to four feet. I say go 20% below the four feet. That way you know you're under the frost line, you know you're under the heave and that, and if you're still hitting soft soil, then you have to look at whether you want to mushroom the bottom out or whether you want to go deeper. I like mushrooming. I did that in Florida. Now, I don't have the water to mushroom here, uh, but I liked mushrooming. The thing is, a footing or a foundation, a footing, I should say, helps your foundation to sit on stable land, and that's where the soil comes in. So let me show you some of my soil here that I'm dealing with that is not an issue, but it may be where you live. So please, 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 if you live somewhere where there's a frost, um, where, where you have to worry about frost, frost heave, and if you have to worry about um, uh, water tables rising and falling, don't do what I'm doing. Do what the codes suggest, even if you don't have to get a permit. But let's talk about soil type, and I want to take you over to my pit to talk about soil type a little better. Now from behind the camera, for those that don't know the story of the pit, this was to be a water cistern. I had it dug about three years ago and we were going to, um, you can still see the remnants of the rocks. I was going to line it and bring it up with rock and then make a cistern, actually sink a pond liner in. 
Bottom line is my legs went out on me. I got scared that I wouldn't be able to do that much work along with the, making the house over 5,000 square feet. So I cut out the pit. I cut out uh, the size of the house and I've left, I'm left with this. Now we're working on this, but that's not the story here. What I want you to look at is, let's see if we can get in close. I want you to look at these layers here of soil. Now in the very bottom here, when we got down to eight feet, now you can't see it now because it's filled in, but when we got down to eight feet, we were scraping what's called bentonite clay. Now that's what they do a lot of mining of here. Uh, in fact, I was working for a company that did that when I got crushed and uh, uh, my lungs damaged. But at this point here on my property, at about eight feet, you hit the bentonite clay. Now, if you don't know it's bentonite, it'll, uh, it, it, it'll, um, it'll confuse you because it looks like rock and it acts like rock until it gets wet. In fact, we had a fellow that lived over, um, he had a place over there. You can't see it now because it's gone. But he actually dug down, he was going to dig an underground house, and he dug a pit about half the size of this. He got down about 10 feet. Now, he sits about 2 feet higher than we do, and he hit that bentonite layer, and he broke it up into chunks, and he actually brought it up, and he says, man, I got all these beautiful flagstones, and he stacked his flagstones up, and he had that, um, he had that, that nice rock bottom that he thought he was going to build off of. Well, then came one of our big torrential rainstorms that we get, you know, two or three times a year here. All of a sudden, his flagstones melted it away and he had standing water in here and he didn't understand what it was until he figured out that it was uh, bentonite. Uh, that's not stable but all these layers of rock on top of it that have been put down over thousands and thousands of years are stable. So you can see I've got here and I'm going to try to zero in on that one. I have a layer of um, a very stable rock there and then about three feet above it, a stable, stable rock. And then above that, it varies from being gravelly clay mix to, on my property, a sand mix. Now we'll go back over to the, um, sorry, let's go back over to the construction site and, and I'll talk about that. Well, actually, this is not the construction site, but this is my masonry clay. This is the, or my masonry clay, excuse me. This is my mortar sand that I've screened out. I hit a vein of this over in the construction site, and I'm going to go show you. I hit a vein of this, and I dug out every bit of it because it's some of the most beautiful sand for mortar. And if I rescreen it through a piece of screening, I'll actually have um, sand to make my uh, uh, interior plasters with. So let's go back to the pit. Well, I said pit, and I meant construction site. So, in that back wall there, you can see that I hit the, uh, the stable layer of gravel. I continued going down because that layer of sand uh, it actually went there. That layer of sand comes kind of sort of along the fence line here and then curves out this way. So I dug every bit of it out down to that layer of gravel that I showed you over in the actual pit. And that layer of gravel rises over here. So this is all will be down to that layer of gravel and we're going to start from up there. That gives me a stable base to start from. You may not have that stable a base where you live, that's why I keep saying check your um, building codes or check with other people that are building. As far as soil types go, I got it pretty easy here. I'm down to a stable layer here that all I have to do is get to that, take that stable layer, distribute the weight on that and um, pour my footing and then my ultimate foundation. We're going to get into that in the next segment of this, but that'll be a couple of days. I just wanted to discuss soil types and really impress on you, don't do what I do unless you live in my desert. Make sure that you check with builders in your area or your local butt cracks. They're very, very helpful unless they're code enforcement officers that Mrs. Brown has sent to your house. Then they're not so helpful. But make sure you check that out. Now, I'll be back when I've got this a little bit, uh, a little bit more to talk about is in terms of building the, um, the footing. And the difference between a footing and a foundation, the footing goes down to give you stability, the foundation goes on top of the footing and that's what you build with. We'll talk about that in a minute. Well, you gotta love the month of March. In like a lion and out like a lamb is the old saying. And today, well, the lion is roaring. Uh, but I wanted to take a minute uh, just to show you where I'm, what I'm doing here. Now I'm tying down, I'm tying down the um, form on the outside, and I'm going to do something different with the inside that I'll show you later. So I'm tying down this form, uh, and I wanted to show you a trick I learned off of this old house. But first, what I've done is on the uh, two by sixes that you can see, 
These are all set to the cor correct height. Now these have to be right. They've got to be even with the rest of the, um, uh, this footing has to be even with the rest of the footings that I'm putting the concrete block on because the bedroom, bathroom, sitting room area is going to be elevated with a wooden floor and I'm actually putting a wood floor on there and that's the reason why we're elevating it so that the um, uh, humidity is an issue out here in the desert with wooden floors so if I can keep that humidity stay uh, the same on both sides hopefully the floor will last longer but as I'm tying these forms down I'm going to just use my level on the forms these don't have to be exactly matched up as long as they're within an inch, inch and a half, even two inches, I'm okay. So, I have a circular form here, and um, the best way to take a circular form and to actually bend is to take and cut your form, in this case we're 12 inches, but it's actually deeper than 12, I'm pulling from the stone and below that. Take the 12 inches, I took them out, and, and then this one over here, which I put out of frame, is 48 inches long. There, excuse me, take feet long by 12. This one's 12 by about uh, 30. Now, I don't know if you can see here, but what I've done is I've used OSB because I had scrap OSB. If you had to go out and buy lumber, you would want to buy plywood and you would want to use half inch plywood, the cheapest stuff you can get your hands on. There's a good side and a bad side on plywood. You take the bad side, uh, or in the case of OSB, A side, and cut down a little more than halfway. So I have 3 8 inch OSB here. Um, I, cut, I cut it a little bit more than halfway. And you're going to do that about every three inches. And what happens is then you have the ability of forcing a little bend into, I don't know if you can see me, but I'm bending this. You have the ability to force a little bit of a bend into it and you can actually make your curve. Now, if you had to make a tighter curve, you'd do the same thing. You'd cut it tighter. Now, I watched Norm Abrams on this old house cut one where he had to cut every half inch, and it was just as pliable as a piece of rubber. An alternative you can do when you're setting it, um, if it didn't seem to have that kind of pliability, is just soak it. If you've got uh, a big tank to soak the, the board in, soak it until it's wet enough that you can move it. Then tack, then tack it in place with your uh, stakes. Use it, uh, use it that way. But that's what we did here. So now the process here is going to be to level these off and then work on the inner ring. But I did want to stop for a minute and uh, uh, tell you how I did that. I'm looking around because I'm trying to see if there's anything else I need to cover. Not really. Uh, we'll get into the rest of it later. So um, let me get to work. Well, it's been a couple days. The footing is pretty much... Um, formed in, um, I should say the forms for the footing are pretty much filled in. Debbie has literally worked her little butt off getting rocks over for me. She's gotten medium sized rocks to bring our deep, um, uh, the deep hole we dug to remove all this pretty m uh, masonry sand to bring that back up so we can pour the concrete on it and we have a nice, a nice rubble stone foundation that's going to give a little bit. However, while we were working today, I got to thinking, you know, there was something that I'd seen on several other YouTube videos, so this isn't an original idea, none of my stuff here is an original idea, but I'd seen it on several YouTube videos, and I also saw it on one of the Concrete Institute or Concrete Foundation, whatever, Concrete Association, uh, suggesting doing something like this, and I want to show you what I did. I took this wheelbarrow and filled it completely with beer bottles. Now, we're not going to use all the bottles I have, so I'm left with something like a 20,000 bottle surplus around here that I have to do something with. So, um, I can bury them, of course, in one of my arroyos, but now I'm burying them in an arroyo, or I can use them. So what they suggested doing is taking, as you can see, I filled the wheelbarrow full of these bottles. I've got about six rocks in there that weigh three, four pounds each. They're in the bottom. Turn this on, and we're going to grind it up not into uh, a really, really fine tumbled form, but just crack them and break them. Let's see what happens.
thought I'd cut this in and uh, tell you something else too. If you do a search for how to tumble uh, glass in a mixer or something, um, you will get a lot of ideas and a lot of videos. But one video I got, the guy's adding water and he says leave it tumble for eight hours. For what I'm doing here for the um, for the base for the footing, it's only four or five minutes tops that I'm that I'm tumbling it. So don't you know ignore that stuff. If you want to do what I'm doing here, it's like four or five minutes with the rocks dry. There will be a dust that comes out. Stay away from that dust. Don't be breathing that dust in as a just in case measure. Well, guys, the footing's ready for the pour. Tomorrow I won't bore you with pouring concrete because it's just it's kind of like Pearl shampoo. Mix, dump, repeat. Mix, dump, repeat. So I won't bore you with that. I'll show you the finished pour, but I do want to let you get up close here and get a look at what I did or how we've got this prepped out. Now, as, at the last minute, I thought about the bottles. I'm really glad I did. I have over 2,000 bottles um, crunched up in here just as a base for the footing to pour on. I'm going to show you. It's amazing. It doesn't look like 2,000 bottles, number one. And number two, I hardly made a dent in the one pile that I need to get rid of, let alone the other three that I need to get rid of that we're never going to use. But I did come across a really great idea in crunching up the bottles. I'm going to put bottles, the crunched up bottles in here. I'll get rid of them that way so at least I'm not burying them in the arroyo. But let me show you the, uh, the footing. Okay, well, it's a minimum of 14 inches. It's 14 to about 17 inches. Um, by 30, well, by, by uh, 28 inches around here. And I believe it's 32 back there, and it has to be because we need the extra 8 inches. Um, to be able to put the cinder block on to suspend the floor on. But um, we're ready to pour. My estimate is uh, now is about four and a half um, cubic yards. So we'll do the pour. We started with the, with the base dug down all the way through that uh, beautiful soft sand to that hard layer I showed you earlier. And then I built up from the hard layer with rock and then finished it off on much of it with the crushed bottles. Uh, so we're ready for the pour, and uh, that'll be tomorrow, and I'll come back and show you after the pour. just in time. That was the last load of the pour, the last of my Portland, the last of my aggregate, and the last of my lime. So we did a pretty fair job of estimating uh, materials on this one. Let me get this floated down. We'll come back finish this video out. Well, here it is. The footing is poured. The footing is done. It's starting to cure up. It's been 12 days since I started it. I had uh, help. I had a fellow come out here and we worked our fannies off one whole day. Weren't able to get it done. We were able to only get two thirds of it done. So then uh, I, had a, I had a guest come and he helped me and we got half of that last third done and just now I did the last third. So she's poured. She's anywhere from 16 to uh, 20 inches deep. I, I did let it kind of roll on that uh, layer of uh, rock like I said. Uh, and I'm ready to start building right now. We're marking it out and we're getting ready to start building. Where I'm standing here in the center, now the floor on the house is going to end up somewhere in this area here. So all this area in the center has got to be built up. And what I'm going to do with that is I'm going to take every one of those extra bottles that Debbie and I are not going to use in building the place, crunch them up like I showed you and fill them up in here. That way that's, that's kind of a responsible way of dealing with uh, stuff like that. 
it's not ending up in a landfill, we're putting it to use. So, on to uh, putting the rock up. I'll do a couple of little, um, couple of little uh, shorter ones on how, um, you know, on how we're getting the rock in. It's really cool because I'm actually pulling the, uh, the rock for the turret out of Alameda Creek instead of out of my rock fall. And I'm doing it because it's multicolored, it's very pretty, so you better stay tuned for the next video. And until then, it's Robert Earl and Cascade the Wonder Dog out chasing a rabbit somewhere saying, see you later.